From now on, no more hijinks. How y'all doing? Doing uh, pretty good. Got Brad, the uh, shape-shifting vision casting leader here, and Drago, my Russian dog. Uh, say, guess that 90s hairband from the intro and you'll win a prize. Tell them what they'll win, Brad. If you missed the 90s hairband from the Leon Dupree It's Not God, It's You video, here's the answer. Yes, kids, in the 90s, shirt sleeves were a bad thing. Today, we're going to be looking at Mark Boer of Life Church in Boise, Idaho. Somebody sent me the information on, on a video, and, and I watched it. He's teaching on healing, and he, and he pretty much just rehashes the old arguments of people like Oral Roberts, Kenneth Hagin, Bill Johnson, John G. Lake, and all those. Now, this, this error uh, that we're going to be looking at stems from a fundamentally wrong view of God. Now, we'll, we'll be getting into that, but... Uh, First, let me start off by addressing something that I get accused of a lot. I get accused of being, uh, yes, one of those dreaded, awful Calvinists. Well, I don't think I've ever claimed to be a Calvinist, but I am someone who believes the Bible. Now, when I found out what Calvinism was, I was like, you know, that's not so much Calvinism as it is John chapter 6 and Ephesians 2. Uh, so this is not going to be a lesson in Calvinism. We're going to examine the scriptures this preacher uses to teach his doctrine, and we're going to respond with scripture. We're going to believe what, what the Bible says. Um, it's not about promoting Calvinism or anything like that. I don't even, I mean, I believe in the doctrines of grace, but I don't, I don't call myself a, a Calvinist. But uh, I do uh, believe the Bible <laughs> as I understand it. So uh, if that makes me a Calvinist, um, so be it. But... Uh, that's what we use here, not John Calvin, but, but the Bible. That is the only source of authority this channel subscribes to. Not John Calvin or any other man, but the words of Almighty God, okay? So here we go. I want to share with you something that I call healing basics. Now, now God did not create the human race with a need for healing, you know that's the case. It wasn't a part of his original design. You can't find on the third day, fourth day, fifth day. God created cancer. Sickness and disease was not a part of his original plan. Therefore, yeah, you know, if we say, was God, has God always been a healer? Well, there wasn't always a need for it. Now, when you say original plan, are you saying God had two plans? <clears throat> his original and then his backup plan? His plan A and his plan B? Because that's not really um, what the Bible teaches. Isaiah 43, verse 12, I alone decreed and saved and proclaimed, I, not some foreign God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Even from eternity I am he, and none can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Then Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? And back to uh, Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Uh, Psalm uh, 135, verse 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. Ephesians 1, 11, in him we have, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Proverbs 19.21, many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So you don't really get the idea that God is a God who reacts or who can have his will threatened or changed by the actions or inactions of man. Right, there wasn't always, he wasn't a part of his plan, and so there wasn't a need. But we know that when sin entered, the door for physical problems was opened. And that's the history we know today. Going back, everyone has had to deal with physical issues and challenges. Um, but because sin was never the will of God, we can easily conclude that sickness and disease was not the will of God either. If she wastes 
the same as a duck, she's made of wood. And therefore, a witch. Can we, can we conclude that, that it wasn't part of God's plan because it didn't exist then? Um, you know, there was no Bible in the beginning. Can we conclude that the Bible was not the will of God? There was no prophets in the beginning. Can we conclude that the prophets were not according to the will of God? Uh, there were no churches in the beginning. Are we to conclude that churches were not in the will of God? This is all speculation that is above our pay grade, but, you know, just go on. It's, it's been said, there's an old saying uh, that goes like this, sickness is the foul offspring of father Satan and mother sin. Uh, who said that? It was John Alexander Dowie. Uh, he's the one who said this. He, he was a faith healer in the late 19th century who believed he was the reincarnation of Elijah and got rich off a mail-in healing scheme. Seriously, that's that's who said this. But you know, go ahead, uh, go ahead with your with your Bible lesson. All right, never a part of God's original design. Nevertheless, because we live in a fallen world and because things are the way they are, God is the healer. In fact, early on in the scriptures, He revealed Himself that way. In Exodus chapter fifteen and verse twenty-six, He said, "For I am the Lord who heals you." Check out the verse just before it. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara, and the people complained against Moses. What shall we drink? Now, just as a side note, this was right after the people all gathered and sang a beautiful psalm of praise to God for delivering them out of Egypt. How soon they forgot. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. Now, now God put diseases on the Egyptians. I thought it wasn't God's will for people to get sick. For I am the Lord who heals you. Also the Lord who makes sick. Um, check out the diseases he said he would bring on his children if they disobeyed in Deuteronomy chapter 28. It makes the coronavirus look like a stubbed toe. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, with the botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed, from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed, trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night and shalt have none assurance of thy life. Whenever there's a problem, he is the solution. He is the answer. And he revealed himself as the healer. And also the destroyer. Amen. Not for a short period of time, not just for a minute, and then he went on. No, that's just who he is. Because there is disease and sickness and infirmity, he is the healer. I'm looking right at it. Now, we all recognize that even though God is the healer, people in our day and for throughout history do get sick, and some of them even die early. They die young. No one dies early. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, 
So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. I want you to know that those things happen outside of God's will. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment... They don't happen because he wants it to happen. They happen in spite of his will for that not to happen. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So apparently God doesn't get what he wants. His plan is for us to live long and healthy lives. Now what text says that? He said he was going to be using a lot of scripture to prove his point. So far he has used one verse without any context in Exodus chapter 15. If you think about it, many things happen on earth that God doesn't want to happen. Okay, even when you read uh, in the scriptures, and primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in the Old Testament, you read about judgment falling on people. Uh, did you know that that happened outside of God's desire? We'll say, but he did it. Well, he's the judge. Yes, he's the righteous judge. But that doesn't mean he wanted it to happen. How many know if you're just... And there are rules, there are laws, there are a system in place. You have to do things that you don't want. God doesn't want to punish the wicked? No, what judge doesn't want justice? An unjust judge. Uh, you know who said that? God. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. The, the, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Uh, Proverbs uh, 11, verse 1, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Psalm 106.3, blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Psalm 9, 3 through 4, when my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence, for you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. Uh, God delights in righteous judgment, as all judges do. Uh, think about it. Some terrible crime has been committed. Some man or group of men have trafficked children into slavery, hundreds of them. And, and the judge is like, well, you know, as, as bad as I hate to, I'm, I'm going to have to punish someone for this. Yeah, that's not a just judge. A just judge delights in justice. Now, I know some are chomping at the bit with Ezekiel 33:11, where God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but would rather they repent and live. So let's look at that chapter, you know, while we're waiting on, on uh, Mark here to get his, his uh, Bible verses ready. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, when I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. So if somebody sees judgment coming and warns people that it's coming and people do not listen to him, their blood is not on his hands. It's on their own hands. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood... I will require at the watchman's hand. But if he does not warn of judgment, then their blood is on his hands. That is what Paul meant in Acts 20:26 20, when he said he was innocent of the blood of all men because he never failed to proclaim to everyone the full counsel of God. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, 
If you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? So what are we to do? Judgment is coming. The watchman has declared it. What good does it? Uh, what, what good does it do to know that it's coming if nothing can be done about it? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Now God is speaking to Hebrews here using Hebrew parallelism. I take no pleasure in X, but I delight in Y. I do not take pleasure in death, but I delight in life. We see this often in scripture, Luke 14, 26, Jesus says, he who would who would come to me must hate his own family. Um, Verse uh, 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Uh, uh, we're not being told to kill ourselves. You know, Paul is, uh, Jesus wasn't saying, uh, if, if you want to live, you have to die. If you want to die, you have to live. He wasn't telling us to kill ourselves. It's Hebrew parallelism. Paul is not telling us to kill ourselves either. Uh, nor is Jesus in Matthew 16, 20, 25, when he says, whoever would save his life will lose it. Uh, see, we, we have to develop our theology by looking at the whole of Scripture, the full counsel of God, like Paul said, and not just one verse taken out of context in Exodus um, chapter 15. And so I want to lay out for you some groundwork uh, for healing. So I'm just going to skip ahead to where he makes a biblical case for what he's teaching. If you want to see the whole video that they produced, uh, the, a link is provided in the description. Here's another belief, okay, and that is that God wants everyone to be healed today. It is his desire for all people to be healed, and it is a matter of appropriating what he has already provided. Okay? Now, if I said that with a little more unction, that's because I believe that. All right? I believe that God wants people well. Well, one of the... Uh, questions or objections, I guess, that can come up in this discussion goes like this. Well, if God wanted everybody to be healed, I would believe they would be. You ever heard that one? Okay, I understand. If God wanted everyone to be healed, then they would be. But let me point a couple of verses to you. You don't need to turn to them, but consider this. Oh, well, we're going to be turning through them. Uh, you know, it's only in God's word. First Timothy chapter two and verse four reads about God who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, how, how many does, does God want to be saved? He wants all to be saved. That's stated really clear. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, does Paul mean every single person or all categories of persons? In other words, Gentiles and Jews, slaves and masters, kings and paupers. He writes in those cat categories all through his letters. What does he mean in this passage? Well, there's a clue in the verses that follow. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So it would seem that no one is exempt from the grace of God based on their human categorization. God did not exempt Gentiles from his plan of salvation just because they were Gentiles. He did not accept kings just because they're kings, Africans because they're Africans, Republicans because they're Republicans, Democrats because they're Democrats, Russians because they're Russians, etc. Another related verse is 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, 
but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Beloved. So who is Peter talking to here? The world? No, he uses the term beloved. He's talking to the church, to believers. I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, there were people in the church saying God is not going to make all things right. He's not going to redeem our bodies. Now, this teacher says redemption of our bodies is included in the atonement and it is for us today. But these Christians here were pretty depressed because they were still suffering in their bodies, but they held out hope that there would come a day when Christ would return and make all things new. Now, these scoffers were saying, now, if that were going to happen, it would have already happened. Peter's saying, look, when God decrees a thing to happen, in one sense it has already happened, but in another sense it is yet to happen. The earth is doomed, though it continues to live. The wicked are doomed. They're dead, though they continue uh, to live. Um, so when it has been accomplished at the cross, that doesn't mean that we experience it in reality now. This is what Peter's talking about. And he's talking to people who say, hey, we should be getting this stuff now. And Peter said, no, you don't get it now, you get it later. But beloved. And there he uses the term uh, beloved again. Do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Toward us, not the world, us. In other words, he will finish the work he began in us, in his church. How many does he want to not perish and come to repentance? All of his beloved, all of his church. This is what the apostle Peter said. Oh, okay, so real simple question. If God wants that, why isn't it happening? It is happening. Everyone God wants to be saved is being saved. But Romans 8 is a whole chapter about it. If he wants everybody to be saved, everyone to repent, everyone to be uh, set free, why aren't they all repenting? Why aren't they all coming to the knowledge of the truth? How many know the answer is because they have something to do with it? It's not just all up to God. It's a God is the author. He's the originator. He's the forgiver. He's the grace giver. But we are the ones who receive this. So God is not in charge of who receives it. We are. We are in charge of who receives the grace of God. I don't know. That doesn't sound very biblical to me. You know, if someone is lost in their sin and they're living apart from God and they're sitting at their home just thinking, well, one of these days I hope God saves me. Oh, what lost person thinks that way? You know, and if you were to ask, ask them, so how are you doing in your relationship with God? How's your spiritual life? Well, you know, I'm not close to God. I'm not even saved because I'm just waiting on him. Uh, lost people don't wait on God. Read Romans 1 through 3. It gives us a detailed account of how lost people think. We don't have to speculate with these hypothetical situations. Well, you would say, no, 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 no don't do that. Uh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can initiate this. God did his part. Now you do your part and receive. You can be saved today. That's Romans chapter 10. Whoever, whether they be Jew or Greek, that's Paul's thing in chapter 10. That's what he's writing about, the salvation of both Jews and Greeks. In chapter 8 of that same book, Paul writes that the lost person cannot even call upon the name of the Lord. He cannot understand spiritual things. This is all a work of God. Salvation is a work of God. <clears throat> now, are we responsible for our own actions? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're responsible for heeding the words of the watchman, as God said in Ezekiel 33. Heeding the words of his prophets, his words given to us as a warning. Now, this is what God says in Romans 10. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all 
who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. One must call upon the name of the Lord. Yes. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Before they can call upon the name of the Lord, they must first believe in him. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Before they can call upon the name of the Lord, they must first believe. Before they can believe, they must first hear. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Without a preacher, they cannot hear. Without hearing, they cannot believe. Without believing, they cannot call upon the name of the Lord. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? God sends the preacher. God sends the voice. God initiates all of this. None of this happens unless God sends the preacher. None of this happens unless God sends his word. Lost people aren't just sitting around going, yeah, I'll, I'll call on his name one day. I'll believe one day. Not really. They don't really believe the gospel. If they really believed the gospel, they would call upon his name now, as Jesus said they would. In, uh, what was it? Uh, Luke uh, 12, I think. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, the violent take it by force. That's kind of the connotation. When, when, when it's there, you grab it. Right? Just like in here. You, there's some listening to this, listening to me right now. Are you going to be saved because you go to church? No, you're going to have to respond. You're going to have to make a choice. Yeah? There's God's part. There's our part. Likewise, it is with healing. Same thing. All these blessings work the same way. God doesn't force his blessings upon anybody. They're not just going to happen. Huh. So God didn't force his blessing on Abraham? Uh, that's not the way I would put it, and it certainly isn't the way the Bible puts it, but I don't remember Abraham soliciting the blessings of God. Uh, I remember a Abraham being a pagan in a pagan land and God coming to Abraham saying, Abraham, here's what I'm going to do. And I don't remember him asking Abraham's permission or, or Jacob's permission or anyone's permission. You, you, do, you, do you recall when the disciples over in Matthew 6 asked, asked Jesus uh, about how to pray? They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And then he gave that little uh, prayer there that we call the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Remember that one? Part of that prayer over in Matthew chapter 6, it's in verse 10. He said, thy kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why, why would you pray that the Father's will should be done? Pray that his will be done on earth? Why, why would you ask that? Because he tells us to, to conform our wills to his. And you'll notice nowhere in the prayer does Jesus tell us to pray that God would heal us. Nowhere in the prayer. Because it's not being done. For someone to say, I believe God always gets what gets what he wants. His will is always done. Then why did Jesus tell us to pray that his will would be done? To conform our wills to his will, not to conform the world to his will, but to conform our will to his will. It's what Romans chapter eight is all about. We are being conformed into the image of the Son, the obedient Son, the Son who always, always, always did the will of his Father. Can I throw this at you? He wants everybody healed even though they're not all getting it. That's why our part in the equation, through prayer, through faith, through believing, through acting on his word, through taking his covenant promises and putting them to work in our lives, is essential for God's purposes and plans to be manifest. Then we're all doomed. We're all going to be sick forever. We're all going to be dead forever. We're all going to be lost forever. If any of this depends on me, I am doomed. Uh, this preacher, though, he's, he's confident he can do it. <laughs> he can do it, his part. He can make sure it happens. God can't make sure it happens, but this preacher says you can make sure it happens. Well, well I can't. <laughs> I, I really can't which is why I need God to save me. Amen. So I want to share this with you today, just to lay some groundwork, foundation. I want to share with you about the will of God. How do I know for sure that God wants me to be well? And before I get into this, I, would, I can tell you this. Uh, we could spend every Sunday for the rest of the year on this one subject and not exhaust the scriptures. No, he can't. If he could, he would. It would be so easy to just go boom, boom, boom every single week and demonstrating from a different angle, a different passage, a different book in the Bible, and you would be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wants people well. He does not want them suffering with sickness and disease. Right. When it comes to understanding God, we have been given a very, very 
clear picture of what he's like, the types of decisions he makes, how he thinks, what he does. And this is, I think, a starting point, even though you can start in Genesis, but a starting point for us to understand his desire for our physical well-being. Are you ready for this today? Are you ready? Anybody ready? Yeah. Ready, 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 ready. The answer is this, is if we are going to know the Father, we just have to look at Jesus. I've heard this from the heretic Bill Johnson. If Jesus didn't do X, then God doesn't do X. Even though Jesus said in John 5 that he is here to continue the works of his Father. Those works being those works done in the Old Testament, like destroying the earth with a flood, like causing sickness in people, in his own people, uh, the children of Israel, like raining down fire and brimstone upon cities, like killing young men with a bear for mocking the prophet of God. These are all cumulative works. Uh, they're all building up to the work that Jesus finishes. Jesus is not a different kind of God. You, you cannot bifurcate him from the God of the Old Testament, though we wish we could, don't we? <laughs> the God of the Old Testament was kind of scary, but Jesus, you know, who would be scared of Jesus? Well, lots of people. <laughs> Maybe we'll get into that. Uh, I don't know where this uh, teaching is uh, going yet. Listen to these verses. John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, to Philip, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? He was thinking the Father was someone totally different. Now understand, the, the Trinity, the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But he's thinking the Father, he's not like you, Jesus. And Jesus says, give me a break. I don't know if he really said that, but, <laughs> you know, he said, if you, Philip, you, you see me every day, you hear me, you watch me, you see how I act. You've seen the Father because it's him working in me. He is the same way. Let's just check out John chapter 14. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. They're united in works and in word, and that is what Jesus means. They're two different persons united in purpose, united in, in will. Their wills are exactly the same. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now these disciples, the twelve, or the eleven, soon to be twelve, with uh, Paul, will continue the works and the words of Jesus, who was continuing the works and the words of the Father. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So now we have the Holy Spirit coming into the work. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in one purpose, one in their work. Whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. So the world cannot receive it. They can't sit around their house going, you know, one of these days I'm going to receive that Holy Spirit. I'm going to take it on myself to get that. I'm going to do my part and receive that Holy Spirit. And this is so helpful for us to know. What is the Father like, Jesus? Now, what is Jesus like? The, the Father. See, it can go either way. But these preachers don't like that. They want Jesus to be different from the Father. They don't see Jesus as Yahweh uh, drowning Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea, which he did. They only see him as the one who calmed the Sea of Galilee. They don't see Jesus as Yahweh afflicting his people with poisonous snakes in the wilderness. They only see him as the, as the brass serpent. Would you, w w will the Father do this? Would Jesus do that? Does the Father say this? Did Jesus say that? Would Jesus do this? Did the Father do that? Remember what Jesus told the false teachers in John chapter 5? My Father has been working, and I have been working. 
remember in Luke 10, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning, and yet he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, the same son, the same God, and yet this God humbled himself. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So God did not change in the New Testament. He didn't chill out. He didn't calm down. Uh, these preachers, though, they think Jesus came not to explain the Father, as John said in John 1, but to exonerate him. They really don't like the Father, these preachers. But Jesus said in John 14 that if you don't love the Father, you don't love him. Uh, Hebrews 1, 3. Who being the brightness of his glory, and it's talking about Jesus, and the express image of his person. What is Jesus like? He's the express image of the Father. Listen to this in the NIV. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. We need not be confused about what God is like or about what the Father is like. It's Jesus. Now, now listen to what he's saying. The Father is like Jesus, but Jesus is not like the Father. He's the image of the Father, but really... It's more like the Father is the image of Jesus, but, but that is not what the text says. Okay, knowing that, doesn't it make a whole lot of sense if we really want to understand the Bible, we really under, want to understand God and who He is and how He relates to us, that we don't start with, I don't know, Job? You know, after Jesus rose from the dead, He found uh, two of His disciples walking along the Mass Road and came up to them and intentionally blinded their eyes to who he was. Then he sat down and, and, and do you know what he did? He opened up the Old Testament and showed them himself in its pages. How the whole scripture spoke of him. How he had been there the whole time. How he is Yahweh. And then their eyes were opened and their hearts burned within them. And then when Jesus appeared to the eleven, right after this, do you know what the first thing he did was? He opened up the Old Testament and taught them. Do you know what the apostles used to preach the gospel to people? the Old Testament. Now, this is like Andy Stanleyism. Now, you don't really need the Old Testament. All you need is the New Testament. From there it goes to you don't really need the New Testament. You just need the Gospels. Then it's you don't really need the Gospels. You, need, you just need Jesus. Then it's you don't really need Jesus. You just need the resurrection and so forth. I'm not going to say, Father, I want to know you. And immediately I go to the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. No, I love all that. There's a rich revelation in there. That's not where I'm going to start. Why would I start in the shadows? I want to start in the light. And if I know Jesus from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and by the way, in our country, those are readily available to anyone. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then I can go back and read Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? David, Solomon, all the prophets. I can read them, but I have the understanding of who Jesus is so I know about the Father. Well, see, it's getting slippery and sticky here. Like the Father is a separate God in the Old Testament. Jesus says the Old Testament leads us to Him, to Jesus. It's filled with types and shadows of the Son, not types and shadows of the Father. This is like a this is like a subtle form of the uh, modalism heresy uh, Mark is teaching. I'm telling you, that the whole thing stems from a wrong view of God, a non-biblical view of God. Yeah, it's like the, the day when when the disciples said to Jesus, "Lord, shall we should we call down fire from heaven on them like Elijah did? Like who did? Elijah did. Do you know what Jesus said? Yeah, that's a good idea." <laughs> Let's toast them right here. <laughs> what did Jesus say? Jesus said, you, don't, you guys don't even know what spirit you're of. That's Luke chapter 9. Remember what Jesus, this same Jesus said in Luke 10? But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. 
Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So Jesus rebuked his disciples because it was not their job to call down a fire from heaven. That was the job of the Father. Their job was to preach the words of Jesus, who was preaching the words of the Father. And you know, John, one of those Jesus rebuked here, got a revelation of this. Uh, we call it the book of Revelation. But the Greek word is apocalypto, the unveiling, the unveiling of Christ. He gives us a picture of this Christ, this Christ coming with his winnowing fork in his hand, and he's coming to bring judgment upon this wicked world. Is that an image to the Father, uh, of the Father to this preacher? Uh, no, he only picks those images he likes. He picks those images of the Father, portray, portray the Father as he would like him to be. Uh, he only picks the images of Jesus as he would like Jesus to be. I might think if I'm just reading Elijah, yeah, when I got mad at people, <laughs> and I come and see Jesus, and he's the perfect image of the Father, say, no, no, that's not how I'm going to respond to this. Now, Elijah was a prophet of God. Hebrews chapter 1, which he just referenced, says Jesus was the last prophet. And he's going to bring fire down from heaven upon this wicked world. He, he says this in Luke chapter 10, also in John 5. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.10, also in 1 Corinthians 4.5, 1 Thessalonians 4.15. The writer of Hebrews in 12.29, 20, uh, John wrote a whole book about it, the book of Revelation, about Jesus is going to bring fire down from heaven upon the wicked. Uh, all these books are in the New Testament, by the way. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful. And true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. It is vital that we know God's position on the subject of healing. And Jesus is the best image, the perfect picture. And so I want to ask, how did Jesus deal with sick people? He healed them to show an unbelieving generation that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. This is what the John says in his gospel. The first answer to people think, oh yeah, well he brought healing. Uh, let me give you a warning about the way that this is described sometimes in church circles. Because it totally damages people's faith. All right, you ready for it? And I've heard preachers say this, and in love I want to wring their neck. <laughs> Don't say that! Don't say that! Without explanation. Here's the saying. It goes like this. Well, you know, Jesus didn't heal everybody. Looking at someone who's struggling, someone who's sick, someone who's got problems. Well, you know, Jesus didn't heal everybody. Say, well, is, is that right or wrong? Well, it's right. It's just not explained. What do you mean Jesus didn't heal everybody? Let me explain it for you. Judge it for yourself. He didn't know everybody. He didn't minister to everybody. He was in the sense of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His ministry was local in nature right? Not everyone believed him. Not everyone came to his meetings. Not everybody trusted the power of God through him. There's all kinds of reasons why not everybody got it. You're totally correct. Jesus did not wipe sickness and disease off the face of the earth while he was here. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. 
and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So the whole city is gathered here at his door and he heals many of them on into the night. But then he does something strange. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. And he left. Jesus left those sick people at his door. And how do we know this? Because the disciples went looking for him. Why did they look, go looking for him? Well, let's, let's let them explain. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. They're still waiting there for you to heal them. Now, these were people who came to Jesus to be healed. Now, this preacher is saying, sure, Jesus didn't heal everyone in the world, but not everyone in the world came to him. But here is a whole city coming to him, and Jesus leaves. Now, why would he do that? Well, let's let Jesus tell us. Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Now, this preacher said all we need is Jesus. If we want to know what God's will is for healing, all we need to do is look at Jesus. Well, here is Jesus saying all this healing is getting in the way of preaching the gospel. Uh, it's my will to preach the gospel, you see. Uh, that's the big thing. That was his message when he started preaching just a few verses earlier. Repent and believe the gospel. Not come to me and I will heal you. If you want to know the will of God for you, it is this, repent and believe the gospel. Here's another statement that's also true. There is not one time where someone came to Jesus seeking healing and he turned them away. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him. I am willing. Be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Then Jesus strictly warned him, don't tell anyone that I healed you. Now, why did Jesus do this? Well, we'll find out. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. Again, they were, they were getting in the way of, the, of his preaching of the gospel. Jesus said not to tell anyone that you were healed because if you do, everyone will want to be healed and I won't be able to preach the gospel. And I came to preach the gospel. Uh, so did Jesus not have compassion on everyone? Yes, which is why he went everywhere preaching the gospel to everyone. However, the report went around concerning him all the more and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Here's another statement that's also true. There is not one time where G someone came to Jesus seeking healing and he turned them away. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. We don't even have one example, not one verse, where someone came to the Lord and he said, you know, it's not really my will for you to be healed. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him. Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Now why did he wait two days? So that Lazarus would die. That's what he tells his disciples. We don't even have one example, not one verse, 
Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed. Now here is a great multitude of sick, and Jesus walks up to only one of them and heals him. And this man was not even a believer. We know this, but what happens after? Now, was it not God's will, will uh, to heal the multitudes? Why, why only this one? Because God does whatever he wants. He heals who he wants to heal. He doesn't try to heal everybody. He doesn't want to heal everybody, but he can't heal everybody. He does whatever he wants to do. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. So what this preacher just said is demonstrably false. Jesus is, did not heal all who came to him, but he did preach the gospel everywhere and to everyone. You know, not one time did, did Jesus answer a question like that, and he said, well, it's not the right timing for you. Now, it's funny he should say that, this preacher, because Jesus' brothers told him once that he should go to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles and perform miracles and healings, and then everyone would know who he was in John 7. Now, guess what Jesus said? My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast. For my time has not yet fully come. Now one time did Jesus respond to people seeking help with their physical needs where Jesus responded and said, you know, the, hey, the, the, the Father is just teaching you a lesson. Except in John chapter 11. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. And John chapter 5. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Or John chapter 9, Jesus says a man's sickness came upon him from birth to teach him and all of us a certain lesson. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So in one instance, we have a believer falling ill and Jesus not healing him so that we might learn that he is the resurrection and the life. In another instance, we have a sinner who is sick because of his sin, and Jesus healed him to teach us that he is the Christ promised in the Old Testament, which he explains later in the chapter. And in another instance, we have a sinner who is sick not because of his sin, but so that the world might see that Jesus is the light of the world. What do we learn from this? Yes, that God does whatever he wants. He afflicts who he will, he heals who he will. He afflicts for his own reasons, and he heals for his own reasons, and he's not beholden to us to reveal those reasons to us. So in these instances, um, he does. John said uh, in the last verses of his gospel that the things that he wrote of were to uh, 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 demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ, that we might believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing him, we may have life in his name. So all these healings, all these miracles in the gospels are not to teach us that we should want what these people got. We should want Christ. We should believe in him. Uh, when Jesus healed a lame man, it was not to teach us that, uh, that if we can't walk, we can believe in Jesus and we can walk. Uh, when he heals the blind, it's not that uh, so we can believe that we can have our sight miraculously restored, so that we might, we might believe that he is the Christ, um, the son of the living God. That, that's really the focus of the Bible. He needs you to learn some things because you are hard-hearted and this is the only way he could get through to you. Now that's actually what Jesus said. A hard-hearted generation seeks after a sign. A wicked and rebellious people seek a sign. So God provided signs. But these signs were judgment upon them. That's what Jesus said in Luke 10. I'm beginning to think this preacher doesn't know anything Jesus said. Then why do these things get taught today? Because they're in the Bible. Why do we represent the Lord as if he says those things quite regularly? Because he did. And if you think about it, have you ever read the passages where Jesus had a great, massive meeting, thousands of people, and the scripture uses this, these, this language, he 
healed them all. And that's true. He did heal them, except the times when he didn't heal them all, as in the passages we just looked at. Uh, does, does this Mark think we don't know how to read? Think about it. If a whole multitude got healed, this was in Israel. They were basically backslidden from God. There's a bunch of rascals in his meetings. There's some liars, there's some cheats, there's some adulterers, there's some mean people, self-centered, right? That not everyone is living a holy spiritual life, and they still got healed. I don't know if, about you, but this helps me to know if they all got healed, there's no way thousands of people were all perfect, upstanding citizens and right with God. That means I'm not disqualified either. That means God's healing power to me is not based upon my earning it or deserving it or being good enough or spiritual enough. It's based upon His grace. And your part, of course. You have to do your part. It's based on your part. Uh, Mark went to great lengths to prove this earlier. He's talking out of both sides of his face now. Amen. Everybody okay today? Yeah. Some of you got the wheels a turning. I'm totally okay with that. Think about this. Ponder on it. Pick it apart if you want. Just do it with scriptures. That's a, that's a characteristic of false teaching. They just they're inconsistent, incoherent, uh, and and they just don't even make sense. They contradict themselves. It's because it's made up. Uh, men lie. You see, <laughs> it's in their nature. Uh, but God does not lie. He does not contradict Himself. And the one thing we know about God from the first verse of the Bible until the last verse of the Bible is that God does whatever he wants to do. And if, if, if that is your foundation of God, of your knowledge of God, then uh, you have to accept some pretty hard truths. For one, we don't like the fact that there's someone out there who does whatever he wants to do while we're sitting here, can't do hardly anything we want to do, right? So we want to make God a little more like us. We want to make us a little more like God, but God is nothing like us, not in the sense that, uh, that we think. Uh, the image of God is, is not uh, that we are like the little gods that the uh, heretics uh, talk about. God is not like us at all. That's hard for us to accept. And some preachers don't even accept it. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm rambling now. These, these kind of teachings make me angry because I see their effect on people. Uh, you, you tell people that it's not God's will for you to be sick, and then you, you're sick, and so you start thinking, well, I must be a bad person. I must not even be saved. I must not have enough faith. What they do is they heap unnecessary burdens on people. They heap legalism on them. And, and you know, you know, you, you, you got to show yourself faithful if you want God to heal you. I mean, God will be faithful to you if you're faithful to Him. So, if you feel like he's not being faithful to you, you need to just work some more. Work, 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 work. But, but that's the freeing thing about the gospel of grace, the, the, the doctrines of grace. Um, it's not restrictive at all. It is liberating uh, to just finally come to acquiesce to the fact that there is one out there who does whatever he wants to do. And what he wants to do is save sinners from the penalty of sin and death. That's the focus of the Bible. That's the theme of the Bible. That's the point of the Bible. That is God's word to us. He, the almighty sovereign God of the universe, who can do anything, chooses to save sinners from sin and death. Anyway, y'all take care. Talk to you again soon. I still got t-shirts. This one is grow up, grow a real beard and preach the gospel. I still have uh, our jeans ain't skinny, but our theology is fat. That's fat with a pH. And uh, what's the other one? Uh, touch, oh, touch your neighbor and say theology. Uh, those are available for $25. The uh, information's in the about section of this video. God bless. Talk to you all again soon.